finish up chapter four, we're going to look at two different types of protein structures, and then we're going to talk about protein folding. So first we're going to start with the two major categories of protein structures that we see, fibrous and globular. So the names kind of uh, evoke the shapes of these molecules. So fibrous proteins tend to be long, thin structures. <clears throat> and they're, may, they're often used for structural purposes. So things like, you know, building a rigid structure or providing a structure on which other components in the cell can move or providing movement, uh, a mean mechanism for movement in the cell. <clears throat> Globular proteins tend to be more, not necessarily round, but more compact than fibrous proteins, and they have a great, greater variety of structure. Variety of structure. And these are, these can, are used for any function that you can imagine uh, in the cell that a protein would be used for. So used for a huge variety of functions. So you have things like enzymes, protein um, or channels that go through the membrane, um, all sorts of things. All right, whoop. so we're gonna start uh, by looking at a few representative fibrous proteins. So the first is keratin, and you may have heard of keratin before. This is what hair and nails are made out of. Okay, so... Um, so material used in hair, nails, hooves, if you have hooves, you know those kinds of things. <clears throat> All right, so how do we get these long, narrow structures? Um, we're going to look at uh, three uh, separate fibrous proteins. The first is going to be keratin, then we're going to look at silk, then we're going to look at collagen. Right, so keratin is an example of a multi-subunit complex. Okay, so we've got a multi subunit context, so it has quaternary, a type of quaternary structure. Okay, because it has multiple chains. So, what you see in keratin is that it is mainly helical in nature, um, and the helix itself, the individual helix, is right handed. Okay. So so individual chains form a right-handed helix, right? And then the second strand coils around it in a left-handed coil. So you'll see this, so you'll see this coil going around and crossing to the left, right? So that, so this is Multi multiple chains coiling around one another. I'll fix that so you can read it. There we go. Okay, so um, we've got these long helices, alpha helices, and then we have multiple chains coiling around one another, and then the way we might get a strong structure, for example, like a nail or a hoof, is by doing what's called cross-linking the chains. Okay, so anytime you see structures that are that contain 
additional interactions between parts, between subunits, between chains. All right. Cross-linking adds strength and stability to whatever structure you're looking at. And we're going to see this again and again uh, as we look at biomolecular structures. Okay, so we've got cross-linking between between the coiled coils. And that cross-linking in this case is due to disulfide bonds. So they're often called disulfide bridges. Okay, so we can have different types of cross-linking. Okay, so so things that are common in proteins in general, not in keratin. In keratin, it's the disulfide bridges. But we so we can have disulfides. We can have what are called salt bridges. And I've used this term before, but I want to make sure that everybody knows what I mean by it. That's an ion-ion interaction. So it's essentially an ionic bond between a positively charged side chain and a negatively charged one. And that's going to be important in the function of uh, hemoglobin, as you'll learn next week. All right, and then we can have other types of linkers in, um, in uh, different classes of macromolecules. Um, we can have peptides being used to cross-link carbohydrate chains. Um, and so you can have, you know, occasionally you can have uh, other types of organic linkages, okay, or co or co those would be like covalent bonds, okay. Um, and then the final one that we're going to see when we talk about collagen is hydrogen bonds. Ah. Hydrogen bonds. Okay, so that's keratin. So the next type of uh, fibrous protein example that I want to look at um, is, oh, you know what, we're going to, there was one thing I forgot to mention, okay, um, with regards to the disulfide bonds in keratin. So again, keratin is what makes up hair, and it's, um, Strength comes from disulfide bonds between the fibers. And um, anyone who has um, been in a hair salon when someone is having their hair straightened or maybe gets a perm or some, some other type of process, you'll often smell a sulfury scent. Um, so what ha these disulfide bonds will help maintain the structure of the hair. So if you have curly hair, okay, the disulf there are going to be disulfide bonds that um, that stabilize those curls and and that they they hold the chains these these uh, coiled coils in a further coiled conformation. And so if you want to either straighten your hair or if you want to make your hair curl, what you would do is you would use a reducing agent to reduce the disulfide bonds. Okay? Then you would put your either straighten the hair or you would put it around a curler if you want it to curl. And then what you would do is you would uh, reoxidize so that those disulfide bonds form when your hair is in you know, the shape that you want it to be, whether straight or curly. Okay, so disulfide bonds play a, a major role in you know, making our hair curl or not. All right, so that was an example of an all alpha helical fibrous protein. So another uh, fibrous protein that we're going to talk about is the silk protein. Okay? And the silk protein 
is a bait is an example of a beta sheet uh, containing protein. Okay, so this is this is all beta structure. Okay, in terms of its secondary structure. Um, and so what you see is we've got again multiple chains. Okay, in the case of silk, it has three subunits. Again, we've got quaternary structure. And what you'll notice is that we have beta, we have uh, what look to be parallel beta sheets, okay, next to one another, okay. And this is you can get this because we have separate chains, okay. So the chains can be, you know, there's you, there's no need to to turn uh, because there are just separate chains that are beta structure that are forming that might be forming your sheet, okay? And what you get, again, is you get, um, you get a lot of um, van der Waals contacts and hydrophobic interactions, okay, between your uh, side chains on the, on the sheets, which makes for incredibly strong um, structures, okay? So, so, um, hydrophobic and van der Waals, which remember is our name for uh, dispersion interactions or induced dipole actions between side chains make for a very strong structure. Okay, so that's, so we've seen an example of an all alpha helical fibrous protein and an all beta sheet fibrous protein. And so now we're going to look at uh, a, a protein that is fibrous that contains neither alpha helix or beta sheet, but a, a kind of uh, a, a novel type of secondary structure. So, so collagen... It's neither alpha helix or beta sheet. Its structure is called a collagen helix or a collagen type helix. So before we go into the details of a collagen type helix. I want to make one other point about fibrous proteins that we're now on our third example and what you might have noticed is that all three examples contain only one type of secondary structure or are majorly dominated by one type of secondary structure and this is very common in fibrous proteins. You see a much more diversity of secondary structures in globular proteins. Okay, so fibrous proteins have less diversity of secondary structure. Usually a repeat of one type. Okay, whether it's Oops, whether it's alpha or beta. So let's talk about the um, about collagen. So <clears throat> excuse me. So collagen itself is found in cartilage and tendons, things like that. Okay. So again, we're using these for structural purposes, right? So if we go back, we've got our hair and our nails, and then. For silk, it's used to build the structure of either a cocoon or a web. Okay? And then for collagen, <clears throat> we find it in cartilage and tendons. Okay, so um, what does a collagen helix look like? Well, one of the, so we have three chains, okay, so three 
left-handed helices, and they are of the type called a collagen helix. Okay, and so you'll notice that <clears throat> it's very extended and it looks rather zigzaggy more than coiled. Okay, and the reason for that is due to the amino acids that are making up the helix. And so the other thing about collagen is it has a sequence, what we call a sequence pattern or sequence signature. And the, the, the signature of this sequence is that you have a repeat of three amino acids, glycine, proline, and then four hydroxyproline, okay? So you will have different types of collagen and there will be um, a little bit of you know variation that you see you know with some other amino acids inserted now and then but the the key to forming the structure is having these prolines and remember proline is the one whose side chain bonds back to the backbone so it causes a kink in the chain so that's why you have this kind of zigzaggy chain right now, the other feature here, again, that is unique to collagen is this, this residue right here, 4-hydroxyproline. Okay. And the 4-hydroxyproline is important in further strengthening the structure. Oops. All right. So if we look at um, the collagen helix, all right, we, it, to our eyes, it just looks different, right, um, than an alpha helix. They're left-handed, they're zigzaggy, and they're coiled around one another, okay? And so if we look at what the backbone's doing in terms of our Ramachandran plot, I'm going to zoom in here, okay? And so the region of the Ramachandran plot, if you'll remember, this is a map of the phi angles versus the psi angles for every amino acid residue in a protein. And so things that are in right-handed alpha helices, you will find in this region here. Things that are in left-handed alpha helices will be in this quadrant here. Okay? And then beta sheets tend to be in this top left corner. Um, but the uh, if you have a collagen helix, okay, the backbone is distorted in such a way that it's in this region, kind of close to the beta sheets. So the, the one thing to kind of keep in mind about a beta sheet versus an alpha helix, okay, is that, so beta sheets have a more extended chain than alpha, helix, alpha helices. And that is, and that's clear from the fact that if you look, the the phi psi angles are closer to 180 degrees than they are in um, the alpha helices. Okay, the, the, so if your angle is smaller, it means your chain is turning tighter. Okay, so the collagen helix uh, being up here is also evidence that the backbone is much more extended in the collagen helix. So, collagen type helices are also more extended. And you can see that again, if we go back to looking at the image of of that collagen helix. You can see that the chain really isn't turning. It, it's more kinking than turning. Uh, so an alpha helix would be turning like this, right? So if we looked at four re the four residues you would see in an alpha helical turn, so if we map that onto here, we've got one, two, three, four. That in an alpha helix would be one full turn. But if we look in the collagen helix, the time it takes us to get kind of back around 
to where we were is more more like six six residues kind of thing. Okay, so all right. So the first thing about the collagen helix, okay, is that it has this extended backbone. It's got prolines in its uh, in its sequence. So let's get back to this four hydroxyproline. Okay, so the four hydroxyproline um, is uh, a what we call a post translational modification. So this is a post translational modification. So what that means is, so we've got the collagen gene, okay, on the DNA, and that gets made into collagen mRNA, right? And then that gets made into a protein that has glycine, proline, proline, right? Then what happens is post-translational modification, where an enzyme causes a hydroxyl group to be added oops onto the proline okay so we're adding a hydroxyl group onto oops i'm going to move that so it's easier to see there we go that gets added onto the proline. So, a, so an enzyme, okay, catalyzes this step. <clears throat> so it catalyzes the addition of the the hydroxyl group onto the four onto the fourth position of the proline residue. So we have four hydroxyproline. So what significance does that have, right? Think about the properties of a hydroxyl group. A hydroxyl group is polar, but it's also a very good hydrogen bonding group. So what this does, okay, is it increases hydrogen bonding interactions between chains. and it strengthens the structure. And the classic example that's, that's always used because it's, it's a very relevant one is uh, the disease scurvy. Okay, so, uh, so remember that collagen is used to make cartilage and tendons, okay? Things like that. And so scurvy, is a disease that you get where your cartilage starts to break down or become weakened in structure because this post-translational modification doesn't occur um, or is occurring inefficiently. And when does it occur inefficiently? So let's change colors so we can... All right, so the disease scurvy... disease where collagen is not uh, modified efficiently. So structure gets weak and you get things like bleeding gums and, and weakness and in the tendons and things like that. So what's the cause of it? Um, it has to do with this enzyme right here. So the enzyme that hydroxylates the protein requires vitamin C as a cofactor. So a vitamin C deficiency will cause you to have scurvy, to contract scurvy. And the easy way to cure scurvy is to provide vitamin C. So citrus fruits. So this is, this is you know, why 
sailors would have lemons or limes or oranges um, so that they wouldn't get scurvy. Um, so... So a lack of vitamin C causes scurvy. All right, and it's all again due to the fact that you can't you have fewer hydrogen bonds between the chains and your structure is weaker. Okay. So now let's talk about some globular proteins. So, so globular proteins tend to be spherical, okay? Um, the title on the slide is a little bit misleading um, in that you can, ha you can have multi-subunit protein complexes or, you know, individual chains that, that fold into a compact ter tertiary structure. There we go. Okay, so here's an example of uh, a, a protein that's used to help package um, a bacterial virus. Okay, so this example is a DNA packaging motor for the bacteriophage, which is um, a, ba a name we give to a virus that infects bacteria, um, and it's called Phi29, okay? And so this one in particular Okay, is a protein that is uh, that has a monomeric subunit that gets repeated. Okay, so notice that this one has uh, just one type of subunit. All right, and we call this the alpha subunit, and it arranges into what we call a homododecamer. So, dodeca is twelve, homo is the same, right? And the, the type, you know, we said there's one type alpha. So the quaternary structure, right, we would say is alpha, tw alpha and then subscript 12, right? All right. Um, so if we look at how these things, uh, these subunits associate to form this beautiful kind of wreath-like structure, um, what you'll see is kind of uh, exemplified by this schematic figure right here, is that there are going to be complementary interactions, and those involve both shape and um, as well as interactions. So remember, whenever we have molecules coming together, it's like a puzzle where the pieces have a shape, okay, that has to fit together, but they also, the, the, the pictures on the puzzle pieces have to be, you know, have to join together in, in a way that, you know, creates the overall sense of the picture. So, so what we have is we have to have both shape and non-covalent interaction complementarity. So things just have to fit together. And that's how you get these um, different larger structures made up of one single subunit, from one single subunit. All right. So, and then having these kind of uh, sort of deep interactions between the subunits makes it possible for something that might happen over here, okay, can impact something over here, all right? So, so an event here, can be detected even on the other side of the molecule 
because we've got, you know, these close connections. So if I push this one this way, all these other ones are going to be, uh, are going to move in response to that. It's like a multi-car, you know, rear end or pile up in traffic. All right, so that's one example of a globular protein. Um, another classic example are the immunoglobulins. And this is, this is a, the immunoglobulins are a large category. It's a, it, it's a type of fold. So it's a type of fold or shape that is used in lots of different proteins. And specifically those involved in the immune system, hence the name immunoglobulin. All right, so um, the basic structure of an immunoglobulin is that it has four chains, right? And those four chains have two of them are long, and we call those the heavy chains, and two of them are short or shorter, and we call those the light chains. Okay, so we would say this has, oops, in terms of, there we go, in terms of its quaternary structure, we could say it's, you know, H2L2 if we wanted to. All right, so what is holding these things together are, are a series of disulfides and so there's one at the base of where the heavy and light chain joins. And then there are two um, at the beginning part of the heavy chain where, it, where there is no light chain on the, on the other side. Okay, so we've got four, it's got four disulfide bonds. Hold the chains together. All right, so functionally, right, this protein uh, gets kind of divided up in terms of what are the roles of the different parts of the molecule. So we have two sort of major components, and you can see them in the structure here, how we divide it up, okay? And so this here is called the FAB fragment, F-A-B, so F subscript A-B, and this is called F-C for F constant. So feature of the constant domain is that it has a more conserved sequence. So different um, immunoglobulins. So for example, antibodies, okay, our body uh, makes antibodies in response to encountering some type of foreign invader like a virus or a bacterium. And there's going to be part of that molecule that recognizes the foreign foreign in substance and that part is the FAB fragment and we call the foreign substance the antigen okay so the the reason this is called a fab fab fragment is that it binds and it's the part that binds to the antigen and so this is a foreign substance that the body will encounter and this is the spot at the tip of the fab fragment where there are both the heavy and light chain um, is where it's going to bind. So the other key feature about that antigen binding site is this portion of the molecule right here, okay, is what we call the variable domains. So the immune system can use this kind of Y-shaped structure, okay, and it can use it to, to recognize a variety of different things. So you can have, so you can have um, thousands and thousands of different substances recognized by having thousands and thousands of different antibodies, each of which has its own unique variable domain antigen binding site. But if the response to a virus is, you know, is for, you know, a certain cascade of events to occur, that's going to be the same for most 
viruses that the body wants to encounter. So it doesn't need a whole unique structure down here. Okay, so, so in this region, the sequence is much more conserved. So that's, so everything here, all right, it has a much more conserved uh, feature. Part of that is to pr provide this kind of constant, this shape of structure. Okay, so that's why this is constant. And then this end of the molecule right here, okay, this part interacts with other parts of the immune system. So this end recognizes invader, okay, and then this end mediates the response to the invader. And that's the structure of an immunoglobulin and, and basically how um, it, uh, it, how its structure is designed to specifically for that particular function. Okay. So we're going to be looking at tons of different globular proteins as, as we move onward and talk about protein function, when we talk about enzymes, when we talk about um, the... Uh, we'll talk about fibrous proteins when we talk about uh, motor proteins. And so for, for now, we're going to end this chapter by talking about how a protein goes from, let's go back here, how a protein goes from um, a gene on the genome to its final functional state. All right, and, and so we're going to look at this, the, the sort of last step in this process, which is translation. Um, and it's specifically what occurs after translation, which we call protein folding. Okay, so what is protein folding? It's, you know, a protein getting to its native state. Okay, so this is going from a freshly translated chain. Let's call it peptide chain to a functional, functionally uh, structured protein. Okay, so going from primary all the way to its tertiary or quaternary structure. All right, so the way that we usually think about this in biochemistry is we think about, we have this very long chain, okay? And it's, in order for it to uh, perform its function, it has to be in a specific conformation. So let's say this one has, oops, that was a terrible helix. So let's say this, this one has an alpha helix and maybe a, sheet here and another helix. We'll make it a little guy, okay? So protein folding is going from here to this. And along the way, <coughs> there are lots of different shapes that it can have, okay? And the thing that causes it to form a specific shape, all right, are going to be the intermolecular forces between the backbone and side chain atoms and side chain and side chain atoms and backbone and backbone atoms. And so, and, and that can happen in a productive way where you get to your structure or you can have mistakes along the way. Okay. So when we're here, we have a long flexible chain that has a very high degree of conformational entropy, but we have to get to this one conformational state. Okay. And then the difference between going from this state to this state has a free energy change associated with it. Th this state is the lowest energy state of your protein. Okay, so this is going to be the lowest delta G state. Okay, this up here is going to be the highest uh, entropy state. Now, the way we go from having a high entropy to having this conformation 
that is uh, that is a, a f very favorable free energy is we have to make lots of favorable enthalpic interactions along the way. And so, and so we can map this on what people often call a folding funnel. Okay, so this is a folding funnel here. Uh, where we keep track of, you know, basically how locked down the chain is. So the more you lock into a specific confirmation, the less confirmational entropy you have. And so that's why this narrows, okay? And then um, anything that has interactions between parts of the chain, so you make a helix here, and you've got favorable hydrogen bonding, maybe you've got some hydrophobic interactions, so that's going to reduce the free energy of that state. And, and so eventually you're going to get to what we call the native state okay, of the protein. But along the way, you can get stuck in what are called you know, local minima. So, you know, so here's, there's a little dip, right? And so your protein might get stuck here and you might need help. So you can think of this as if uh, you're, you know, if you're driving downhill, right, you're going to roll down the hill. But if there's like a pothole, you know, th that might slow you down. If there's a sinkhole, you might get stuck in it and you might not be able to get over the barrier to get keep going down the hill. Okay. And th so, so when a protein gets stuck, that's what happens. Okay. All right. Um, so... This is what we usually look at in terms of um, the, um, how a protein folds. Now, does every protein go from this to a completely functional, fully folded structure? Um, well, when I was taking biochemistry, we thought that was the case. Um, but uh, as the field has progressed, we now realize that there are these things called intrinsically disordered proteins. So they'll often be called um, IDPs. Um, sometimes you'll hear them called intrinsically unstructured proteins. And what these are is uh, they're, they're proteins, and about 50% of all proteins, it turns out, have some unstructured regions just when they're kind of floating around in solution in the cell. So what you'll see is most of the time it looks something more like this, partially ordered. Okay, so this would be partially ordered. And, um, and so what you'll see is things that have low sequence complexity, maybe many polar residues, um, prevent you from forming this like really non strong nonpolar core, okay? Um, but they don't stay this way, okay? So, so a, a structure will form, okay, under certain circumstances. So for example, when that function needs to be activated, maybe a small molecule binds somewhere and causes it to finish forming its structure. Or maybe another protein will come along and bind here, and that will change the environment for all of these unstructured residues, and then you'll get this structure forming. Okay, so the key to IUPs is that they form defined structures upon binding other molecules and this activates their function. So this is another way that we can control chemical reactions in the cell is by having a, a whole variety of ways that we can activate molecules, get them from a non-functional uh, state to a functional state, okay? And intrinsically disordered proteins is one of those. Um, okay, so 
we'll talk a little bit about the process of uh, protein folding cooperativity, right? So um, what I want you to get from this particular graph, okay, is one, it looks a lot like the DNA melting curves. Two, it's what we call sigmoidal, okay? So S shape, we call that sigmoidal. And an S-shaped curve is a signature of cooperative processes. And as we talk about protein functions, specifically hemoglobin and some of our enzymes, we're going to see this, okay? So, and, and so a cooperative process is where after you get binding or some event, then another event becomes easier than it normally would be. Okay, so, so in protein folding, what that means is once you have like uh, a core nucleus of favorable interactions, then folding happens fast. Okay, so um, if we look here, the other thing, again, halfway is always our reference point. Okay, so this is unfolding a protein with temperature. So this is very analogous to the TM of DNA denaturation. Okay, so it's where you have half of your molecules you know, unfold, unfolded or half of your DNA denature. <clears throat> All right. So protein folding happens cooperatively. Uh, there's many different models and ways we think this might happen. So while we can now predict protein folds with the program AlphaFold, uh, we're not so sure how it, it actually happens in real life. So we have three models. Okay, so the first is called hydrophobic collapse. And so that's this one right here. And in hydrophobic collapse, what we, what uh, the theory states that um, basically um, the chain collapses to bury hydrophobic uh, surface area. That's the first thing that happens, okay? So hydrophobic area comes together and then all those other structures form. Okay, the next theory is called the framework model. Okay, so the framework model is secondary structures form first before collapse. Okay, and so you, you get your alpha helices and beta sheets forming, and then they collapse to form your tertiary structure. And then our third and final um, type model is called the nucleation model. And the nucleation model is, um, is neither hydrophobic collapse or the framework. It says that um, a small region of correct structure forms first, and that acts as a seed or a nucleus. Okay, so that seeds forms a nucleus for the rest, you know, for the rest of folding to follow. So when we say something forms a nucleus, it means just like a specific, just like a, a specific site on which everything can happen, right? All right. So in this case, you know, we have our alpha helices and beta sheet uh, just in this region of the molecule forming, and then the rest of the structure forms on top of that. Which of these is correct? It all depends on the protein that you are working with. So some clearly follow a hydrophobic collapse. Some, you know, follow more of the nucleation model. So the reason Part of the reason that we don't fully have an understanding of 
the process of how this happens is because every time you study a different protein, uh, you kind of got a different answer at first. But now we know it ha doesn't have to be one or the other. Um, it can be a little bit of everything or one or the other, depending on what protein you're working on. So when we were looking at the funnel, all right, um, I mentioned that sometimes a protein can misfold. Sometimes you can get lost along the way to folding. And when that happens, the cell has ways of dealing with it. Okay, so things that can happen when your protein misfolds. Um, so these, so these are, whoopsie, there we go, ways cells deal with fixing the problem of misfolded proteins. So the first of these is called chaperones. So chaperone proteins are proteins that help with protein folding or refolding. Um, the second thing that can happen is uh, proteolytic degradation. So this involves um, something called the proteasome. Um, and there's two, well, there's two systems, okay? There's the proteasome or the lysosome, okay? So, so the lysosome is an organelle, right? And the proteasome is a large protein multi-subunit complex. And then uh, the third thing that can happen is what we call agrosomes. So you get transport of your misfolded proteins along microtubules to an area um, near the nucleus. And this can, um, this can cause what we call an inclusion. Okay, so this is like a, this is just like a, a whole bunch or a bundle of misfolded proteins. And there are some diseases that are linked to that. Um, okay. So, but there's also, you can use, the cell can use transporting misfolded proteins to a specific site as a way of then, you know, directing them towards the degradate, one of the degradation systems. Okay. All right, so, oops, this is missing its title. So we're gonna give it a title. So this is all about chaperone proteins. So these are the proteins, again, that are gonna help with the formation of stable 3D structures, just like a chaperone at a high school event, you know, helps make sure all of the, um, things that happen at that high school event are appropriate. So this is chaperone proteins help uh, proteins find appropriate structures to help them function. Um, so things, ways they can do this, okay, is they can make things happen properly from the beginning, okay, so they can help newly synthesized proteins fold, or they can rescue misfolded proteins or they can disrupt protein aggregates. And there's two sort of major structural types. So we'll just, for these functions. So the structures can either be um, what are called a clamp or a chamber type, okay? So you may have heard of heat shock proteins. Um, and the, so these, one of the things that can happen is when cells are uh, exposed to extremes of temperature, okay, um, then the proteins, because intermolecular forces are influenced by temperature, um, proteins can misfold, all right, when cells are, are kind of pushed toward, towards one end of their growth range. And so these mechanisms are activated in response to cell stress, okay? So 
activated in response to cell stress. And the way that they were first discovered was the stress that researchers put on the shell cells was heat. All right, so the, so the clamp type clamps around the protein, as, as you can imagine. And then the chamber type will, would be more like a very large complex where you have sort of like this barrel-like structure where the misfolded protein goes inside. And it, so. And then it'll have some kind of lid. The GROWEL, GROWES has a lid. So you can think of it like the cell's trash can. So this is going to be the chamber type of chaperone. All right, so whether you have the clamp or, or the chamber, what you have is that both bind to misfolded proteins. And here's the key. It takes energy to fix things, okay? They both use ATP hydrolysis. So it takes energy to fix things. And then the other thing that you... That you really need to keep in mind when you're thinking about cellular processes in a dynamic way is that um, cells will have mechanisms for dealing with problems, okay? In response to stress, we get proteins misfolding more, um, but our, our solutions get activated. But the solution is only as effective as kind of the 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 relative rates of which the solution can work versus, you know, how fast the misfolding is happening. So, so you know, we had those terrible hurricanes uh, down south and lots of flooding. And, you know, so you can think of, you know, any type of cellular repair mechanism as trying to combat a type of flooding, right? If you have a small bucket, if you're, you know, if you're mechanism for fixing things is can only go at a slow rate all right you might not be able to keep up with the influx of of damaged proteins just like if you have a bucket and a flood you might not be able to keep up with the water so you have the means to repair it but you can't quite keep up and sometimes you can okay and so this is this can lead to lots of disease states when you when you can't keep up cancer is an excellent example of this with cancer and dna repair all right so i will um direct you towards viewing the chaperone protein animation um, which is much more effective than just looking at a static picture so as you're doing your reading and your homework um, this this is linked on Brightspace, so uh, take a look at that, and you'll be able to see exactly how we bind a misfolded protein, hydrolyze HEP, and the conformational changes. Okay, so so you can view it from the Brightspace link, and note the conformational, the shape changes that occur during the process. Okay. All right, so, um, all right, so then, you know, the, the autophagy lysosome system Okay, so, so this is an example of one of these kind of clamp type chaperones. It's going to break up something uh, that's misfolded and help, help it refold. Um, and so the autophagy lysosome system is found in eukaryotic cells, because remember lysosome is an organelle, so it's going to be eukaryotic cells, not prokaryotic cells. Prokaryotic cells, they have chaperones of, you know, of this type of the type that's going to bind directly to something and open it up. Um, but in this case, um, what you get is misfolded, misfolded proteins or aggregates, okay, are, um, are going to be tagged. 
and they get tagged with a molecule called ubiquitin, which is, it's, it's a small peptide and it's used to direct cell uh, to direct molecules to complexes that are going to degrade it. Okay, so that the tagged molecule binds to a complex of chaperone and co-chaperone proteins. All right, and then what happens is those chaperones uh, interact with uh, dynin, which is a protein that's involved in microtubule-based transport. Okay, so this is so the way we move something into the cell to a specific region, okay, is uh, ubiquitin can recognize a misfolded protein, and it and it and there's enzymes that will add ubiquitin onto that. The ubiquitin binds to some chaperones. So notice the name. HSP70. HSP stands for heat shock protein. That's how this was discovered. It was, we shocked cells uh, with heat and then, um, and then the things that got up, upregulated, we called them heat shock proteins. So the heat shock protein binds to the ubiquitin, which is connected to this misfolded aggregate. And then different parts of the heat shock protein can interact with the microtubule system and get transported to the agrosome. And then that causes this to get directed towards the lysosome, okay? And you'll notice the little scissors here. That is just to indicate that the protein gets broken up into its constituent amino acids. So, so the misfolded protein gets hydrolyzed into individual amino acids. So not the individual atoms, individual amino acids, which can then be reused. So this is one difference between this and say, um, you know, this type of chaperone where you take something that's misfolded, you unfold it and you let it fold properly. Here, you treat it like, well, it's the point of no return. I cannot recover from this. I can't just unfold it and have it refold properly. I'm going to send it to the lysosome and just chop it up, and we're going to start all over again. Okay, So that's what degraded in the lysosome means. It means it gets broken down into its individual amino acids. All right, so um, again... Protein uh, misfolding um, can lead to disease states. So this is why it's a really active area of studying um, for researchers, okay, is that um, if you have, you know, a problem with a protein, right? So in this case, let's look at um, phenylketonuria. So this is a, this is a disease where you have um, you have to eat a very specific diet because you cannot um, uh, properly um, metabolize the the um, amino acid phenylalanine and it leads to uh, toxic byproducts that that um, build up and so the protein itself that is defective is called phenylalanine hydroxylase and it's a mutant protein. Um, that causes the disease, okay? And what happens is the protein winds up being degraded, okay? Whereas uh, in sickle cell anemia, we'll talk about this when we talk about hemoglobin, um, it's also a mutant, but this mutation, you have an otherwise functional structure, but the one amino acid that gets um, mutated causes the protein to aggregate because it takes a polar residue on the surface and it turns uh and it the mute in the mutant whoops in the mutant it's non-polar and so that causes the protein to aggregate and that impairs the function it still functions but it impairs it it also causes uh issues for the cells um, because of the aggregation forms these big fibers <coughs> excuse me so, and then 
So the final thing uh, is, is just to look at a few more examples of this. So um, in cystic, cystic fibrosis, ah, uh, the mu we have a mutation uh, that can either be a mutation or it can be a deletion. And that leads to a misfolded protein. And that protein, the cell's response to that protein misfolding is that it gets degraded. And so you have what's called loss of function. Okay, so problems with a protein folding can either change its function, um, make it lose function, or make it, you know, not appear altogether. It could be degraded. So in this case, we have a, um, a loss of function, and it's a ion transporter, and that causes all sorts of issues. And so in Huntington disease, okay, we have um, a whole bunch of residues added, that causes a misfolded protein, and that causes it to aggregate. And so the gain of function here is aggregation. All right, um, and <coughs> excuse me, so we have added residues. Here we have changed or deleted residue. And then, uh, and then uh, Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease is an example of a, a, what we call a prion-type disease, where it's it's uh, inf it's an infectious protein. And I'm going to put infectious in quotes because it's not infectious like a virus or a bacterium is. But it is a process where if you have a protein, it can have two different conformations. And if you somehow get the second conformation to form, it can induce other proteins that are in the correct formation to misfold. And then you get aggregation. And, then, um, and so this aggregation causes, uh, so these are typically um, uh, neurodegenerative diseases. And so aggregation will cause uh, often the death of neurons and everything that follows from there. So, you know, protein misfolding can happen because of stress or it can happen because of mutations. And this is just some examples of how that happens. All right, that's the end of chapter four. And Dr. Green on Wednesday will be introducing some material in chapter three, uh, chapter six, by talking about uh, some protein function in detail. And he's going to cover the myoglobin and hemoglobin uh, system. So this is we're going to start simple. The, what's the simplest thing that a protein can do? It can bind to a small molecule. Okay, so this is a protein sticking to another thing. And that other thing, in our example, is going to be oxygen. So I hope you have a great week, and I will talk to you, see you soon.